You're in the water loop. <laughs> Waterloop is made possible in part by grants from Springpoint Partners and the Walton Family Foundation. Waterloop. Hi, this is Travis with Waterloop. Water conservation is very important to me, and I bet it is to all of you. That's why I use High Sierra shower heads in my house, and I'm so happy to have them as a supporter of this podcast. High Sierra carries the EPA WaterSense label for efficiency and uses 40% less water than conventional low flow shower heads, 40%. The model I have uses just a gallon and a half per minute. And because of their unique nozzle design, it's patented, nobody else has it. It maximizes efficiency of water and energy use, but doesn't sacrifice on performance. You still get a powerful shower. Use promo code loop20 for 20% off at HighSierraShowerHeads.com. Waterloop. The Waterloop podcast is sponsored by Flume. It's the perfect device for tracking your home's water use in real time on your smartphone. It's so easy to use. You just attach a small device to your water meter using a band, the same way you put a watch on your wrist. Then you connect to Wi-Fi, you download the app, and you're up and running. It's as simple as that. You don't need a plumber. You don't need to cut into any of your pipes or water lines. Very easy to set up. Then you can set water budgets, how much you want to use each day or week. It'll keep track of that. It'll tell you what's going on in your house with water use minute by minute. It'll send alerts to you if there's excessive water use or if it suspects a leak. In fact, when I installed Flume at my house, it told me almost right away about a leak. I was losing a gallon of water every six minutes. I'm honestly not sure when I would have found that without Flume. You can use promo code WATERLOOP for 10% off at flumewater.com. You're in the Waterloop. Welcome to Waterloop. This is Travis. Very pleased for this episode to be with Nusha Ajami. She is Director of Urban Water Policy at, for Water in the West and Senior Research Scholar at the Stanford Woods Institute for the Environment. So nice to have you on the podcast. Thank you for having me, Travis. Yeah, I we were kind of trying to plan what we would talk about here, and I just realized with your incredible depth and breadth of expertise on water that I really wanted to to ask some big picture questions and kind of get your thoughts on that. Um, so so let's let's start there. How would you describe the way that water is managed in the United States? That's a that's a giant open ended question there. But what comes to mind for you? Um, you know, when I look at the problems you are facing today from, uh, you know, impacts of climate change to um, urbanization to environmental pollution, uh, just, just name a few, um, then I very quickly start thinking about the infrastructure that we have built in the 20th century and how appropriate they are to meet these today's challenges. And then that easily sort of morphs into the fact that some of the laws and um, laws that are sort of uh, governing this system that we have have been put in place in the 19th century. So this is a complex process um, that uh, sort of feed into each other and it's um, it's causing a lot of problems for us when we are dealing with today's uh, challenges. A couple of things to touch on. One is the fact that we built this infrastructure system that we rely on today um, with, um, I think, three main um, elements of these things that I really care about. One is we built them in a once-through system. So we use water, we bring water to people, we use it once, and then we just um, uh, take it away and uh, clean it and put it back in the environment. Um, so there is uh, this concept of circularity doesn't really exist in the existing model we have. The second thing is uh, we built everything on the concept of abundance. There's always another drop of water to go bring. So you can use as much as you want. Um, there wasn't a con, uh, the, the, we weren't as, as conscious as we built the system on the uh, limitations we are facing and how uh, the, what are the natural limitations we face. Um, and uh, 
The third thing is um, we build it in a very fragmented way. So we have um, we bring water to people, we take the water from them as form of wastewater, and then we deal with um, uh, stormwater and uh, rainwater cap as a sort of nuisance, nuisance that you need to sort of get uh, get it as fast as you can and put it out the system as fast as you can. So, and each one of these boxes have their own rules and regulations on how we want to manage um, the system. So it's complex. It's sort of uh, outdated in a way, and uh, and we are facing so many challenges um, in today's world that um, very much impacts um, the way we deal with our water supplies. How has water management maybe evolved and improved in the over the past few decades if if you think it has improved in some ways it has certainly improved incrementally obviously uh, as you face different challenges we have uh, tried to sort of face it in different ways for example we have become much more efficient in the way we use water um, uh, you know, we uh, have much more efficient appliances. We have much more efficient uh, uh, fixtures in our household. We use a lot less water than we did, we did um, uh, 40 years ago, 50 years ago. A lot of cities actually uh, around the U.S., if you look, you see even though as their population has grown, their water use hasn't really changed. Uh, and a lot of that can be attributed to this um efficiency that we, ha we have been building into the system. So we have certainly made a lot of progress. Another thing is we have definitely come to realize there have been consequences um, of the system we built and uh, we have been trying to deal with it. For example, you know, we, we have now Clean Water Act, which has, uh, it's sort of getting close to its 50th anniversary, which have been trying to keep our water bodies from pollution and preventing uh, any, um, uh, uh, unintended consequence of some of our activities uh, um, uh, that uh, we undertake, for example, industrial activities. So we have definitely improved the quality of the water in our water bodies. Um, so that that has been a huge progress for sure. And, um, and this is just to name a few. Sure. And there, are, there have also been a lot of other activities happening. But a lot, some of them have been definitely monumental. For example, Clean Water Act was certainly a monumental um, uh, shift in the way we do uh, manage our water. Uh, but some of them have been incremental and they all have made us better in the way we manage water. Mm -hmm. What about maybe the, even just the past 10 years or just in the 21st century, the past 20 years here, 21 yeah. years, I guess. Um, what, it, what do you think has happened over the past you know, 20 years, changes or uh, shifts in the approach to water management? Sure. I think efficiency is definitely a newer thing. We have definitely put that in place in the past 20 years. Uh, it's interesting to think about it because some of that has been actually driven by our, uh, our intention to um, uh, be more efficient in the way we use energy. Uh, so it, that's where it was started. And then eventually sort of morphed into water um, uh, more. If you think about, you know, all the appliances that we use in our household, um, you know, we have been trying to make them more energy efficient, which means we have to use less water to heat less water to um, spray less water. So all of that has um, has less energy implications. So that's why um, the energy has been at the heart of some of the efforts we have done around water efficiency. And then also, obviously, um, we have um, uh, done some more work. Around, for example, let's, say, let's talk about California, um, you know, Finally, we have realized we have to manage our groundwater better. So we have a groundwater law. Um, you know, before that, we have a wild, wild west, if you think about groundwater in California. Um, so, um, so we, you know, the drought in California, the recent severe drought that we have exper we experienced between 2012 and uh, 16, uh, led into some of these uh, efforts around groundwater management and better water management. Um, again, uh, you know, they have all been important and um, sort of, I, I call this actually uh, adaptive governance as we are sort of facing more challenges. We have to adapt to the situations we are in and we are sort of trying to change the way we govern and manage water um, as we face uh, the different challenges. That's the thing that's jumping out to me as you kind of describe some of maybe the flaws in the way that we built 
the system and the philosophies. Uh, and then you have all these forces that are happening as we, you know, climate change, continued population growth and development. Um, the infrastructure itself is aging. So like, how do you, how do you begin to turn the giant ship, um, you know, while it's, while it's still moving and, um, you've got this giant country, you've got all these water systems and, uh, so much to address. How, how can you begin to, to change that? I'm, I'm, actually, I'm, I'm leaving it up to you to, to solve here, yeah. <laughs> sure. <laughs> there are a few things to actually, main things to think about. One is, as we are actually, this aging infrastructure is definitely at the heart of a lot of problems we are having, for sure. And as you're facing climate change, and uh, there's there are always, in every challenge, there's an opportunity, right? So we have to replace a lot of this infrastructure that we have. And as, when we were building this, in, building this infrastructure, um, as we talked about it earlier, we really didn't think about the role of nature. We sort of had this whole engineering approach that let's conquer nature to achieve what we want. And that abundance um, was sort of um, uh, the goal we had around this conquering nature. And now we are realizing, you know, nature actually can be our ally in so many different ways. And we have to work with nature if we want to build a more resilient and sustainable future. Um, so as we are sort of dealing with aging infrastructure, we have to really rethink what does it mean to have, what, what does infrastructure mean exactly? How does it need to look like? Do we really look at our parks and waterways and, um, uh, you know, trees and nature actually as a whole as part of this infrastructure uh, system that we have? Or are we still sort of thinking about gray uh, man-made infrastructure as the only thing that's going to sort of uh, guide us through the future? And um, so that's one thing. I would say another piece of this is also, um, it's just not just about infrastructure that we build. It's about how we set up the system uh, and what preferences that system sort of leads to. So for example, uh, you know, we have, um, you know, water agencies that we have out there, and they're, they're built to provide, the, they're sort of designed to provide services to people, right? But people are sort of at the end of that pipeline. They are just receiving services. They're not part of this loop of um, the decisions that they make or their preferences are not necessarily part of this loop. Um, so we, um, so sort of how do you sort of change that process uh, to make sure that people are at the heart of this? There's a study done actually uh, by at the University of Illinois, which is, uh, which I find very interesting. They asked people, so um, that they um, interviewed a number of people and they asked them to draw uh, what they think their water system looks like. Hmm. Uh, or water use six system look like water use cycle look like, and there were some people who were very sophisticated. They were like, "Water comes, you know, there's a mountain, there's infrastructure, it brings it to us. There's a wastewater treatment plant, treats it, put it back in the environment." And there were people who basically said, "It rains, there's magic, it comes out of my shower or my tap." <laughs> and you know, it's not an uncommon thing, right? right? Because we are so disconnected from this system that we don't even think about it where it's coming from, where it goes, what happens. So then, then that leads into how do we pay for water, right? Because if I'm really not understanding what it takes for that water to come to me, I'm not really valuing it enough, right? I'm not willing to pay for this aging system that you're, we, a lot of different parts of countries uh, has to you know, it's facing and has to replace and um, has to sort of deal with. Um, so that disconnect is also there. And I say, um, you know, one of the major problems in that, that part of this puzzle is this outdated uh, business model we have, uh, which needs to be revisited. So um, we have to think about nature as an ally. We have to revisit how we do uh, what's the business model we have that in our uh, sort of water management system. Um, and we have to bring people and make them more involved in the process rather than just thinking about them as a sort of like a, a rate paying hmm. um, group that doesn't necessarily um, have a, a role to play 
in this change that you're experiencing or at least the shift you hope to to achieve sure well there are a lot of great examples of uh, uh, you know adapting or adopting nature-based infrastructure you see more and more of that with using wetlands to filter and and trying to kind of Mm -hmm work with nature and use it as part of the water treatment cycle and water management cycle. I guess it is difficult or will be difficult that as cities and others look to dig in and replace infrastructure, it's real tempting just to just replace the pipe, right? Just put in in the pipe and the same thing. It's, it's hard to, to do something radically different when you're just trying to get by and, and, and meet your standards and deal with that water. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah. And I think you touched on a very important word, which was standards, right? Uh, another piece we have in, uh, in this whole sort of broken system uh, we have or outdated system we have is we have very uh, outdated um, standards and performance measures that actually uh, puts preference on these um, sort of 20th century infrastructure that we have or very highly engineered solutions that we have. And at the end, we have to finance these solutions that we want to put in place. And if we don't have the right standards and performance measures, the money often ends up going to those older and more um, uh, systems that we think we have the right standards for or we have a proven track record for. Mm. Um, And that's also an issue. The the business model point that you you made, um, I'd like to just kind of hear about that a little bit more, um, and just kind of understand what the what the problem is there, and and how it maybe should be changed uh, to to be part of better water management. What's what's wrong with the business model? So a couple of things. One is uh, we talked about the fragmentation, right? So fragmentation is caught. There's a challenge there because the Um, each one of these agencies or water utilities are dealing with one part of the pie. So that fragmentation means it's causing issues with how uh, we invest in solutions. How do you think, how do we think about water? Which part of this water cycle are we trying to manage? The second thing is, as I said, it's a top down system. So people are not at the heart of it. And the way we have set up these systems is that we um, charge people for, let, let's talk about rate setting process, mm. for example. And again, this is, uh, there are exceptions out there. There are some changes that we see in this, in this uh, uh, landscape, but it's, uh, I'm talking about the majority of mm-hmm. utilities that are out there. They, the way that we charge people for water is uh, you pay for it, the amount of water you use, right? It's sort of like a commodity. As you use more, you pay more. And this is an issue because at the end of the day, we have fixed infrastructure that needs to be maintained and dealt with, right? So we have to make sure we can maintain our reservoirs, our pipes, as our pumps, our um, treatment plants. All of those have to be dealt with and maintained. And no matter how much water it's used, those systems are there, mm-hmm. right? So if you use a drop of water or you use a pool full of water, mm-hmm. Um, you still, that system needs to be operated and maintained. And if you're using a volumetric way of charging people for their uh, water use, then the, there is a, uh, there's not much incentive to encourage people to use less water because as they use less water, there's re- less revenue coming in, which means we have less water to, in- less money to invest in those systems. Right. So this disconnect between fixed cost of infrastructure and the variable cost of the amount of water people using is a huge issue. And in water, actually, these two are sort of, in general, between 70 to 70, 30. So 70% of the cost associated with our, uh, in, in our water bills is associated with our fixed cost, which we have to recover no matter what. Um, so that's one thing. The second thing is, I think, going to the business model thing is um, this, this whole concept of um, you know, where, how do we finance? I think it's, uh, it's an issue. Uh, how do we finance infrastructure and a preference of that old business model to these deterministic outcomes? For example, there's a difference between nature-based solution and 
um, as we talk about like an engineered solution. If I am putting a wastewater treatment plant, I know um, if I'm putting a dollar in, I'm going to, you know, um, treat this much amount of water or wastewater. And this is the outcome I'm hoping for, right? If I am sort of putting the preferring or sort of uh, putting a preference on uh, investing in um, nature-based solutions or green infrastructure, I have to deal with some of the uncertainties that exist in nature, right? Because it's not a deterministic outcome. So, um, so then uh, there's a chance that I might not be able to say for every dollar I put in, what do I get out, right? Mm-hmm. And the old business model we have does not prefer this smart the system, this newer sort of uh, more uncertain and uh, na- nature-based um, approach. Um, and and that financing piece is really important as part of this process. So it's fragmentation, the way we set rates and the way we charge people and the way we actually measure performance of our infrastructure. That's just sort of um, some of the some of the issues that we have with these um, old business model. Sure. And the, and the third piece you mentioned about, you know, the customers or the people in, in the community. Yes, um, absolutely. You know, it's it's almost that the water sector needs to get into social science in a way, and and absolutely, and and, and more. I mean, more communications and marketing, which I'm happy to hear about. But um, yeah, that's a that's a, a huge part of it. It's hidden infrastructure, like everybody says. It's not like the roads you drive on and or the absolutely that you use. So yes, um, we have big challenges. Which people are willing yeah. to pay more for. <laughs> they are. They are. Absolutely. Um, look at what our cell phone bills are. It's, it's, it's amazing. Exactly. Um, so we've got big challenges. You've outlined a lot of it here. What, what makes you optimistic about our ability to build a, a more sustainable water future? Look, I think um, I always want to be optimistic. <laughs> There's always, as I said, challenges um, uh, are, can, you know, there are opportunities that you can um, uh, take advantage of and move forward with. And, um, and I think there are a lot of examples out there that we can use a different path forward. For example, let's think about infrastructure. Um, as we move forward, as we are thinking about the future, I am actually quite optimistic to see how much more these distributed systems from rainwater capture to uh, on-site reuse to reuse, centralized reuse to, um, you know, um, uh, all sort of better wastewater treatment, all those things are sort of becoming, or actually the most important <laughs> conservation and efficiency and green infrastructure are sort of getting more traction. Mm. And there's a lot more interest to sort of at least consider them in the process, or at least give them a chance in, and you, we can see more and more, more and more of these examples out there. Um, and, uh, and that actually mm, makes me very happy to see uh, the opportunity of understanding how these uh, new uh, infrastructure is going to fit in that old infrastructure model, uh, sort of model and system that we have is, is a, is a huge. And we have, we, you know, the, um, we have to be better at thinking about that and being able to kind of understand how seamlessly we can put these two systems together. And that makes me optimistic to see how there is a lot more thinking around these system level approaches, how we want to build uh, these new communities, what do we need to consider? Um, and also, you know, uh, the, the opportunity to, um, you know, uh, again, when it comes to conservation and efficiency, I go back to that. You know, people, every one of these droughts, we just recently did a study and we were comparing actually uh, energy sector and water sector and how different, how the, the uh, use uh, and uh, pa- pattern of use have changed over time. And what I see is every one of these droughts that we are experiencing or every one of the, you know, um, some of the flooding events that you're experiencing in the East Coast with like too much water and um, what a quality challenges we are facing, you see people sort of step back, rethink, readjust the way they approach water. And that sort of gives me hope because I like to see informed customers who are willing to engage more with the system 
and willing to understand uh, what is going on and be part of this process rather than just being the, at the end of the pipeline to be part of this process. And that keeps me optimistic because I think as water utilities are realizing they have to engage more with the customers and as customers are sort of realizing the importance of water in their daily lives and um, they're sort of reading more in the newspapers, in the news, in, in t- on TV and all these different platforms that provides um, hopefully uh, science-based information to people, you see them actually being much more positively reacting to the process. Another thing I would say is uh, that's helping these customers to be part of the process is they are sort of, we see the shift, you know, again, comparing to the energy sector, uh, we have gone through the past 10, 15 years, a lot more solar panels on people's roofs. And uh, you see people are sort of changing from just a customer to producer and a customer at the same time. And that sort of shifts that the, uh, that role that people have or customers have in this process. And we see some of that happening in the, in the water sector as well. For example, in San Francisco, this whole on-site reuse systems are turning people from customers to consumers or producers and customers, like putting the two words together. And, and they're, you know, they are becoming part of the process. And that, that is hopeful because they can, um, they understand, they can see the challenges, they can be part of the process. And they're hopefully they'll be more willing to invest in the systems that we have, we need for the future. Well, you made you make me more optimistic when you outlay all of that. There, that's that's good. I, lastly, I just wanted to kind of ask about the the water in the West there at Stanford, and just a little bit about what you all do and how you're kind of trying to help help lead us all toward a sustainable future and be part of this effort. Sure. Um, so I, I can talk a little bit about my program, and then I can expand on some of the other work that's happening. So my team works on sort of building resilient communities. So we try to use uh, so many different tools to make this happen. For example, we uh, pride ourselves to use a lot of data science and informing, sort of understanding the pol- policy and human aspects of water systems. And we hope that that would lead into a better uh, water future. For example, we have been trying to build uh, 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 something similar to a cap and trade model uh, for the water sector. And the idea there has been to make sure we can create this collaborative environment for uh, different communities to build regional resiliency from um, uh, investing in each other's conservation platforms, from investing uh, in infrastructure in different communities, trying to actually bring these communities together to work together rather than sort of being in their own personal silos and investing in their own little solutions. Um, So creating sort of like a um, a flow of money and resources at the same time, um, uh, money and water in different directions. Um, we have been trying to sort of understand how we can uh, change our permitting processes and um, sort of understand how we can um, make the permitting processes a little bit more um, um lenient and interested in the uh, in these newer solutions that we have and what needs to change in the process. How can we make it more efficient? How can we make it more uh, um, sort of um, uh, open to some of the solutions that we uh, see sort of popping up in the uh, process? We have been actually looking tons on customer level behavior. What do people do? How land use change is impacting water use? How um, uh, new sort of uh, urban plat- uh, urban forms that we have are changing water use? How political leniency of people are changing their water use patterns? How different um, uh, ways of providing information to customers is impacting their water use patterns? So we have done a lot. We have put a lot of focus on trying to understand customers. And you mentioned the whole... Um, sort of um, uh, the intersection between social sciences and engineering. And I think uh, what my team has been doing is trying to bring these two fields together closer to each other and trying to kind of use different kind of information and data to do better, uh, to better understand and sort of shed light on uh, some of this. And as part of that, one thing I would say is um, 
one of the flaws I didn't mention in the water uh, in uh, in the in our business model is we constantly think as population grows, demand is going to grow, and we have seen in the past forty years that that's not the case. And uh, economic growth and population growth has sort of uh, decoupled from water use. Um, the water um, use patterns. And we have been trying to sort of, in my team, trying to uh, provide better sort of forecasting tools for, for utilities to kind of see where the water use patterns have been and where it's going and what is really informing that pattern change. Uh, is it, if it's not population growth and economic growth, then what is it, right? So we have been trying to use different um, sort of alternative data sources to uh, test this and see what is impacting people's water use patterns. And in the broader Water in the West program, we have uh, people who are working on groundwater and uh, groundwater management and how um, uh, we have to be better at incorporating climate change as part of this groundwater management patterns we see. And uh, a lot of work in um, um, sort of understanding uh, environmental impact of all some of our decisions and how we can improve uh, watershed health by uh, using different uh, technologies or platforms or laws and regulations. Um, so we have a vast uh, number of projects that are, have, are touching on different parts of water uh, cycle and water um, as a whole. And I'm happy to elaborate on any of them, but yeah. you know, well, I'm yeah. sure people can go to the website and see. Well, you are all are incredibly busy. That's that's uh, impressive and fascinating, and I can already hear a bunch of uh, follow up podcasts I can do and digging into some of those those topics there. But uh, thank you so much for your time for the for this episode. Fascinating. Um, I definitely encourage people to go to go look at uh, Water in the West there at Stanford. Learn more. You all are putting out really interesting information all the time. Um, but Nusha, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you so much, Travis. It was lovely talking to you. Thanks everyone for listening to today's episode. A special thanks to Waterloop supporters, Springpoint Partners, and the Walton Family Foundation. The Waterloop Podcast is sponsored by High Sierra Showerheads, the smart, stylish way to save energy, water, and money while enjoying a powerful shower. Save 20% with promo code WATERLOOP at HighSierraShowerHeads.com. WATERLOOP is also sponsored by Flume, the smart water monitor that tracks your home's water use in real time and provides data on your smartphone. Save 10% with promo code WATERLOOP at FlumeWater.com. If you like WATERLOOP, please subscribe to the YouTube channel or your favorite podcast platform. Follow us on social media and visit waterloop.org to sign up for updates. Waterloop, Waterloop, Waterloop.